does the mind end and the world begin? Is your mind contained within the boundaries of your skull? Um, you know, we use external objects in all sorts of significant ways to aid our cognitive processing. Uh, and as a result, the environment and our mind are really linked at a fundamental, fundamental level. And in 1995, uh, two philosophers, um, Annie Clark and David Chalmers, published a paper in which they argued that there's something very important about this connection, um, that in essence, objects embedded in our environment function as part of our mind. And uh, they called this the uh, extended mind theory. Uh, and it wasn't initially uh, uh, accepted in academic uh, departments, but eventually became the most widely cited paper of the decade. And the way that they illustrate this concept is with a thought experiment. So Inga uh, hears about a museum exhibition she'd like to go to at the Museum of Modern Art. And so she thinks for a minute uh, and remembers that the MoMA is on 53rd Street. This is New York MoMA. Um, and, uh, and so she goes to 53rd Street and, uh, and goes to the museum. Um, and so it's clear that Inga believes that MoMA is on 53rd Street, uh, and she believes it even before consulting her memory. So the belief is kind of sitting there in memory, waiting to be accessed. Oops. Now, I'm supposed to go back. There we go. Now, Otto, on the other hand, has Alzheimer's disease. So, and like many people with Alzheimer's disease, he relies on information in the environment to help structure his life. And so, uh, in this particular case, he's got a notebook that he carries around with him wherever he goes. And when he learns information, he writes it down in the notebook. When he needs to access uh, old information, he looks it up in the notebook. And so he hears about the museum exhibition and decides that he wants to go as well. And so what does he do? He looks in his notebook and learns and reads that uh, MoMA is on uh, 53rd Street. And he walks to 53rd Street and he goes in. And so what's important about this is that in this case, Otto's notebook plays the role that would typically, typically be played by a biological memory. And the information that's contained in the notebook is functionally analogous to information um, that is what makes up a standard, ordinary memory. It's just not contained within his skin. So this is the extended mind hypothesis. And I would say that it's, it's not a new idea. Uh, well, the, I, the characterization is new, and the level of you know, the rigorous analysis of this phenomenon is new. But the extended mind has been with us for as long as we've been uh, using technology. So you can think back to the abacus, which was first used in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, and even counting with your fingers is an example of using an object to think, uh, an object in your environment. Uh, so and in fact, this idea has now gained a lot of traction. Uh, some, archaeolo uh, some archaeologists say that when they're excavating lost uh, civilizations, they aren't simply reconstructing objects, they're reconstructing minds. So, oh, I, oops. There we go. So, um, so, I'm not here to kind of debate the merits of this hypothesis, uh, whether it's good or bad. Um, I will say there is an ethical dimension um, to this that if I have time, I'd like to come back to. Um, but I'm here to talk about modern technology. Uh, and so uh, I think it's probably not controversial to say that, you know, modern information technology, particularly things like computers and smartphones, have led to a real explosion in um, mind extension of the sort that I was describing. Um, you know, we've come to rely on our smartphones for all sorts of things. Um, everyone knows this. You know, cognitive tasks like, you know, GPS uh, navigation, remembering things, calculation, calendars. So it's really kind of the canonical example of an object contributing to the extended mind. Some people even call it their, ex you know, their external brain, for example. And uh, um, so, so the question then becomes, what can we learn that's useful? 
is, you know, beyond just a philosophical discussion, what can we learn that's useful from this? Uh, and, you know, can we learn something about an individual's mind based on this careful analysis of how mind and environment are linked? And it would be convenient if we could, because, you know, cell phones are ubiquitous. Uh, Three billion in 2014 globally, and it's projected to be uh, twice that next year. And we check the phone, you know, over 75, over 70 times per day at this point, and touch the phone over 2,500 times per day. So it really makes it more ubiquitous than clean water, uh, electricity, and plumbing. Here's a quote from Chief Justice John Roberts that I like. Cell phones have become such a pervasive and insistent part of daily life that the proverbial visitor from Mars might conclude they were an important feature of human anatomy. So then what, I don't know if how well you can see that, um, what can be learned uh, from a smartphone about uh, brain function? So in the early 2000s, a physician and uh, computer scientist named Paul Dagum uh, was doing pioneering work in a field that we now refer to as behavioral analytics. And he was working on a cybersecurity tool uh, to catch hackers and bad actors. And what he found was that he could do that just by looking at patterns of how people use their technology, what we now refer to as human-computer interactions. And that's because it turns out that human-computer interactions uh, represent a sort of neural fingerprint. Um, and so Paul had a key insight. He said, uh, well, if that's the case, then there must be something about neural functioning captured there. You know, at that point, all he knew is he could identify an individual, but there must be something beyond just that to this, uh, to this concept. And so he did a study, and this study uh, involved uh, having a, a set of subjects uh, complete uh, a battery of neurocognitive tests of the kind that are standard in neurology departments for detecting and monitoring and uh, characterizing cognitive deficits. But he also had them download an app on the smartphone. And the smartphone app collected data passively in the background, and this is tactile user data, um, things like taps and swipes and clicks and that sort of thing. And then the question was, could he train a machine learning algorithm to predict, in essence, their results on these gold standard neuropsychological tests simply based on this input from the smartphone? So and these are the results of that original study. And I'll pause here for a minute and then I'll zoom in on one of these plots to help uh, us see what's going on here. But in essence, each of these plots is a different task um, of some kind, so working memory, for example. And each blue dot is one result from one participant. Uh, and then the red dots are the results predicted by, uh, by the algorithm. And you can see the overlap is pretty impressive. So here's a, here's a closer look. Uh, this is a perceptual uh, reasoning task. And again, the blue dots are each, are each blue dot's a different per, uh, participant, and this is their result on that task. And then the red dot is, is the prediction. So, I mean, the overlap is, is, pretty, ast is pretty astonishing. Um, so he published this paper, and you know, quote from the abstract, passive measures from smartphone use could be a continuous ecological surrogate for laboratory-based neuropsychological assessment. Um, so he got together, based on the promise of this technology, with Tom Insel, former head of the National Institute for Mental Health and a uh, world-renowned neuroscientist, and Rick Klausner, uh, former head of the National Cancer Institute, uh, and now uh, also world-famous scientist and uh, a successful serial entrepreneur. And they formed a company called MindStrong Health uh, where I serve as chief clinical officer to develop and commercialize uh, the technology um, that Paul pioneered. Let me go back one. So, uh, you know, just to, just to make it perfectly clear, the, the technology doesn't 
analyze what people say, it's how they say it on their phones. So it's actually kind of agnostic to content. So it's looking again at these subtle tactile user activity patterns. And at first it seems that, you know, this is incredible. How could it be the case? How do you get results like this? But if you think about it, you know, after a poor night of sleep, I mean, think of, we're touching the phone 2,600 times per day. So after a poor night of sleep, you know, you're typing, you're going to type less precisely or more slowly than you would after your second cup of coffee, you know, or, you know, after you have a drink of wine, for example, on the weekend. All these things are going to influence, um, you know, the precision of your typing, the speed with which you scroll, and it's these micro patterns that we ended up calling digital biomarkers that are, in essence, neural, digital neural analogs of the physiological biomarkers that we are accustomed to from things like uh, diabetes and that sort of thing, blood glucose. Actually, what's, you know, if you think about it, um, you know, the, the paper, and, paper and pencil tests that, are, uh, that comprise the gold standard neuropsychological tests that we still use and have been using for 100 years in neurology, um, really that actually relies on the extended mind idea implicitly as well. Um, so there's something kind of fundamental about how we interact with tools that explains or gives us a window into neural functioning. And what's exciting about the smartphone is it's something we're carrying around with us at all times uh, and has some other important features that I'll talk to, speak to in a minute. If I can go forward, there we go. So yeah, so uh, what other features does it have? So it's a communication device, obviously, so it can close the loop. So it's not just an opportunity to learn something about the patient, you know, it, as exciting as that is, because we're learning something that's happening continuously, passively in the background, requiring nothing from the patient other than just to use the phone that, in the way they normally do, but it's also a communication device, so we can reach out to the patient at the moment they need it most, and like I said, close that loop. So uh, it connects individuals such as the patient and the providers, but also it could potentially connect members of support groups and that sort of thing. So, you know, we've seen how in other fields like uh, neurology, uh, sorry, radiology, ophthalmology, dermatology, uh, AI and systems biology are really starting to disrupt how care is even conceptualized, let alone how it's delivered. Uh, and I really like, you know, Leroy Hood's concept of P4 medicine, predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory medicine. And, uh, and so I think that our tool, or, and tools like this, uh, really make this sort of thing a reality, or at least a, the potential for reality, since it's still early days. Um, so that's, that's what we're trying to accomplish, uh, and, and this is how we're doing it in practice. So I was recruited to uh, MindStrong, a little over, I guess it's 15 months ago. And um, the premise was we have this powerful tool, but we don't want it to just be a diagnostic thing. We want to actually close that loop in the manner I just described. So we created uh, a virtual clinic. You know, it was really an opportunity to reimagine how care gets delivered and conceptualized in mental health. So this is kind of a, I'll walk you through it. So in the middle, you've got the patient who's just using their smartphone in the way that they typically do. I have it on, on my phone. And uh, there's an app where, uh, in addition to collecting the data and generating the biomarkers, the patient is able to see their own results. And the hope is that they will, over time, get a better understanding of the sorts of things that influence how they're doing, uh, you know, in terms of their brain function, but also their mood, anxiety, that sort of thing. And then the psychiatrist and the therapist and other members of the care team can also be given the opportunity to monitor how their patient's doing between sessions, which I can tell you for myself as a practicing psychiatrist, is really a godsend. You know, there's, um, there's an old, old joke that, uh, you know, a therapist knows in great detail how their patient is doing um, on Thursday at 3 p.m. And between that, they have no idea. Uh, between sessions, they have no idea. And so this, you know, hopefully solves that problem. You know, um, I can't tell you how many times you know, myself and colleagues, uh, the first time we learn that someone's decompensated is when we get a call from the emergency room. 
And this gives us an opportunity to intervene before that happens. And how does that work? Well, in the bottom right, you have a, an army of really highly skilled mental health professionals um, that are monitoring 24-7 these digital biomarkers uh, and reaching out through the app, through phone, calling emergency contacts if necessary, calling uh, mobile crisis if necessary, um, at the earliest sign of trouble. And I'm happy to report that um, we're now live in several states delivering care through the smartphone to patients with severe mental illness like schizophrenia, bipolar, Another thing that makes me quite proud is, in contrast to some of the other companies in the industry, we're really focused on the least fortunate and most severe cases. And there's already very positive evidence um, that we're reducing the utilization of emergency rooms and emergency care more generally. So it's, uh, it's very exciting. Um, I wanted to, if I have time, talk briefly about the link between physical and mental health, which I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. Um, basically, this is kind of undisputed at this point. The, this graph just shows that um, mental, health is, mental illness is overrepresented in individuals with chronic health conditions. Uh, and I won't go into each of them, but basically it's all. Um, the red bar is the percentage of people with that condition who have mental illness, and uh, it's greater than the blue bar, those without mental illness. It's also been shown that for people that have these comorbidities, if you treat the mental illness effectively, then you also have an impact on their physical health, and that makes insurance companies happy because then they cost less also. Um, and there's some interesting talks uh, at this conference that are related to this. Um, but I wanted to, in, you know, in my final couple minutes, actually share a, kind of a vision or a prediction I have that looks at the opposite direction of influence. Um, because basically the, the brain is an exquisitely sensitive uh, organ. It consumes more glucose than any other organ in the body. And we know, if, you know from med school, you know, if there's liver disease, if there's kidney disease, if there's thyroid disease, all of these things have an impact on brain function. And so, if you have a tool with precise and, that's precise enough and sensitive enough, you should be able to learn something really powerful about how the rest of the body is behaving. And so I predict that digital or any sort of cognitive phenotyping technology that's powerful enough will become really standard part of how chronic health conditions are monitored um, and detected. And, and, and so I think that'll be really powerful, especially if it's something that someone's carrying around in their pocket regardless. So in my last minute, I mentioned there's an ethical dimension to all of this. Um, so if the extended mind theory is the case, then, um, then there are objects that people, objects in our environment that have an impact on the kind of thinking we can do. Um, and that means that people that are deprived of those objects are really at a disadvantage. Um, Andy Clark tells a story that, you know, he lost his laptop and felt so disoriented uh, and enfeebled that it was as if he had had a stroke. So, I mean, the, the, and I think we've all experienced what happens when we don't have access to GPS. So, people that are, that are at a disadvantage, you don't even have the kind of basic paper, paper pencil, and notebook objects. You know, they're really, um, you know, it's clear evidence, more evidence of the impact of poverty and uh, inequality on the uh, livelihood of these kids and their ability to play, uh, for, to, um, for there to be a level playing field. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you.